It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Missanelli Podcast. Podcast episode number 96. We inch our way to the Golden 100. Tuesday, July 11th, we're doing this podcast. Of course, brought to us by Bet Rivers. If you haven't downloaded the Bet Rivers app, uh, do it, please, and, and you can make some some big cash. You get golf. Golf is a good way to make some cash. I'll tip you off. So uh, get that Bet Rivers app, and you can actually play casino games with it. You, you can change your bet. You can call it off. You can do it in in session. The whole thing. Uh, if you were betting on the NBA Summer League with the Bet Rivers app, uh, I seriously would suggest therapy. But uh, that's just another matter. The Bet Rivers app is great. Today we have a monster guest. We are going to be talking to CBS and yeah, many other uh, entities because he happens to be the top broadcaster uh, in, in the world right now. Uh, Ian Eagle will join us. That's right. We get the big guest here. Ian Eagle coming on the Mike Maselli podcast today. So stay tuned for that. But let's start out with what we always start out with, the current. And um, for me, the current this week has been the situation with Paul Reed. Would the Sixers sign him? Would they match the offer by Utah? And Danny Ainge put out a pretty interesting offer out there, uh, which kind of forced the, the Sixers maybe not to match it. Here's what he did. He put a clause in it saying that uh, in the second and third year, that money is completely guaranteed if the team gets to the Eastern Conference semifinals. So he's saying, okay, if this if the Sixers match, they're in salary cap hell as it is. So if they match, they'll be in further salary cap hell because that money will have to be guaranteed because certainly they're going to be in the Eastern Conference semifinals. That may be not the same for Utah, right? But but certainly for the Sixers. So thinking that that was going to push him away. And there was a lot of consternation this week as to whether the Sixers would actually match the offer of $23 million, uh, about $8 million a year in salary for Paul Reed. Um, I am always shocked by the reaction in Philadelphia for mediocre players. I, I'm, I'm frankly stunned by it. I, I mean, to see, there's a difference between talent, real talent, and, and talent that people go overboard with. And people in Philadelphia, and listen, I spent maybe 30 years trying to convince them that you get carried away with lesser talents because they, they give you the appearance of hustle, right? P- p- people in Philadelphia love these scrappy type of guys that can't really play, but they love the scrappiness out of them. And I say, l- recognize real talent and recognize it with your own eyes. All right, so you know where I'm going with this. I, I Social media reaction had Paul Reed like Bill Russell. I swear to God, they, they, they're going to lose Paul Reed, they're going to lose Bill Russell. Uh, this overreaction. The same overreaction happened years ago with this backup center named Tony Bradley, who everybody went, oh, you got to keep Tony Bradley. And then you go back further with TJ McConnell. It's always guys like this that the Philadelphia fans overreact to. All right. So in any event, the Sixers do match. Now, that puts them over the luxury tax by $6 million, but under this new apron that the NBA has installed where it was really punitive. So they were willing to go over the threshold, but under the apron of luxury tax, which is really prohibitive. The Sixers are now, in case people don't know the situation, they're already over the salary cap. I, I read this uh, reaction. They weren't going to sign Paul Reed because they were cheap. Before they signed Paul Reed, they were $48 million over the salary cap. So in other words, even if you get rid of hardened salary, you're still over the cap. People don't understand this, how the salary cap works. So they, they are about $50 million over the cap now uh, with uh, signing Paul Reed. Fine. All right. Now, we know the hardened situation still has to play out. So we don't really know what the Sixers are going to be next year. Um, you have to account for Harden either pl- coming back or them getting a substantial player for Harden, which is going to make them a decent team, a contender. Maybe not a contender over uh, the likes of Boston or Milwaukee, but there's, the Sixers are very much on hold. So now let's get back to, to Paul Reed. Um, B-ball Paul. I, listen, I, I don't want to sound like I'm ripping the guy because I actually liked him when he was coming out of seat uh, of DePaul. I, I watched a lot of college basketball, and I said, who is this kid it, that got to DePaul could play like this. So they they drafted him, and I said, okay, maybe he's got some promise. Uh, but uh, people go, uh, they think they know more than the coaching staff, like Doc Rivers. Oh, I didn't play him. 
Um, Paul Reed averaged 4.2 points a game at 11 minutes per game last year. Okay. Um, and, and Doc misused him. Now, if you're a coach and you're coaching in the NBA, you coach with the players that you can trust when you put them out there. And the trust comes from watching them in practice, but also watching how they respond in games. If you watch closely at guys like Paul Reed uh, and you just focus on him, he has absolutely no idea where to go on the basketball floor. He just doesn't. He doesn't have those kind of instincts where he's a disciplined player. So, yeah, he'll scrap for a rebound or two, and he'll make four free throws in a playoff time, which is really nice, and he'll get an offensive rebound. every. But he's, like, dazed and confused all the time. And so if you're Doc Rivers, you're looking at him, I can't trust him. Well, he doesn't know where to go. I wish I could play him more. So um, I here, here, let's look at the good side now about this whole thing. First of all, they have three backup centers now. And when they signed Mo Bamba and they went back to Montrezl Harrell for a year contract, I'm thinking, well, that means they're not going to sign Paul Reed or they're anticipating not signing Paul Reed. And maybe public pressure made them give in. But now they have three backup centers. So what does that tell you? It tells you one thing for the regular season, you sports fans that want to go down to the Sixers games. I got two words for Joel B next year. Load management. Okay, you got three backup centers. If you think those three backup centers aren't going to chunk up some minutes during the regular season and preserve Joel Embiid, then you're misguided because that's what's going to happen, and you're not going to see Embiid, which may be a good thing, all right, because you don't want to wear them out. But they've got three backup centers. Okay, now here's the other thing. The good of Reed. It is possible that Nick Nurse said, you know, he's the type of guy, like lengthy guys like that, I could turn him into something. Siakam was like that when we first got him. Chris Boucher is like that in Toronto. I, I managed to play smaller with longer athletic guys who can guard. Uh, maybe he thinks Paul Reed can do that. Um, maybe he thinks that he can turn him into a legitimate four, in, in meaning that he can shoot the three-pointer, which is what a four has to do this in this day and age. The four has to stretch the floor and he has to make the corner three you see how the Sixers use PJ Tucker all right he wasn't that successful in doing it to the playoffs he did make some but that shot is going to be open for a four can Paul Reed shoot I don't I have seen no indication that on an NBA level he could shoot a three-point shot now the people that saw him in the G League said oh, he took three a game he made one like he's not a, a he, he could be a shooter if you really focus on it. I don't see that at an NBA level. The NBA is a completely different – it's like baseball. Like you hit the minor leagues, you come up to the big leagues, you got to be able to hit the big leagues. It's a different leap. So to hit three-pointers in the NBA where guys can guard and jump out on you is a different thing. So we, we will see. All right, here's the other reason it could be okay for the Sixers. He now has a controllable contract. And a controllable contract is valuable in future trades. So maybe the Sixers think they can package him now. Somebody looks at his development and says, well, I can develop him. Or he plays this year, and down the line, he shows improvement to the point where the Sixers can now use him as, an, as a controllable asset whose $8 million salary doesn't look that prohibitive. So in, in that light, okay, we, we got it. But I, I just got to say that it is uh, – I, I laugh at this. I, I looked at social media with Paul Reed, and I go, oh, my God, we're talking about Bill Frickin' Russell here. And, and, and I, I can't believe how people go overboard for mediocre talents just because they show activity or energy in a game. Now, Producer Darren, maybe I'm misguided. Is that what Philadelphia Absolutely. does? Uh, how many times do we say it? Do we hear it? If you play hard, Philly fans will love you. And that's, you know... If Otley never won a World Series, he would still be maybe the greatest second baseman in Philly's history because of his hustle and how hard he played. That's what we're drawing. Yeah, but he could uh, play. Right, no, maybe a bad comparison. He could play. Uh, you got to take Utley out of the equation. You got to got got to go to guys like Kevin <laughs> Sefcik. Like that. Like the, I'm talking about the mediocre yes. guys who can't yeah. play, who maybe like get in the dirt and people love them. And I, I, I I'll recognize give you a great real example. talent. He won the Super Bowl that year. Pat Robinson was playing uh, safety for them, and he played hard, made some big plays at wild moments. But he was just an average defensive back. So and guys fell in love with him. Fans fell in love with him. So yes, 
we fall in love with hustle. So I agree with you. Uh, all right. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the NBA summer league, which, uh, is going on right now. And of course there was the, uh, the Wembenyama hot hype and, and game one, I felt sorry for the kid in game one. I mean, he's got a camera like in his face, no matter where he goes, he walks from the, the locker room to the court. He's got a camera following him. He walks into the building and, and there was such anticipation for the kid that I knew game one wasn't going to go well for the kid. Uh, it, it, you know, it just those those kind of environments, and, and you're now at a different level, and he didn't play well in, in the first game. He didn't shoot well. But in, in the second game when he calmed down, he played really well, and he showed flashes of what he is. And, and after that, the Spurs shut him right down. All right, no more summer league. You gave the people what they came to see. We know how you can play. I am not going to play you in this geek league. And risk injury because the NBA Summer League, you know, it, it, it's it's so wild and all over the place. It's almost painful to watch these guys because they're all trying to impress their teams and their coaches with, with individual moves. And it's basketball mayhem. It's a flat out mess out there. Uh, but as I looked at the Sixers, you're always looking for a guy who's got some some swag to him, some some chops. And, and Terquavion Smith, the kid they got from NC State, looks like he's got some potential. Now, I don't know if he was ready for the NBA because it's so hard to judge these guys in this kind of environment. But, but I, I thought he was a decent player that they signed after the draft who could be somebody. Now, I don't know where that's going to go. He looks like a G League up and down guy like the other guy that they have. Uh, I even forget his name. He's been back and forth from the Delaware Blue Cuts so many times. And he and he did play okay in the NBA summer league. I, I even forget. I can't. For, I can't remember his name. Darren, help me out here. John, Smith. come on. I have no idea who you're talking about. No, Jesus, God, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, I, I'm gonna get the. I'm gonna get the kid's name in a second. Uh, I, I can't believe I'm blanking out on it. But it's like he's out of sight, out of mind with this kid being up and down. They drafted him when he was 18, and. Uh, and, and now he's, uh, you know, trying to uh, make the team finally. He's a good defensive presence uh, guy. Uh, we'll all right, I'll forget it, Darren. See, this is what a producer's supposed to do. You're supposed to pick <laughs> me up, God damn it! I don't know this guy. Right, he's an obscure G League player. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's been up and down with the roster. I can't believe uh, I'm blanking out on this. Is him. embarrassing here him. for the people listening to the podcast. People are screaming his name at me now as they're listening to the podcast. Call up the damn roster or something. You're a producer. Let's go. <laughs> for crying out loud. All right. Until the, until he does that, uh, let me just say one more thing about the summer league. Cam Whitmore from Villanova. Um, I don't know what he is. I, I really don't. And uh, people are raving that he's a steal at 20. He did have a good second game. He doesn't pass at all. I mean, this kid, now he's got an NBA body and he can score a little bit. And I don't know whether he's going to be a consistent shooter uh, or not. Uh, but he apparently uh, impressed some people uh, in the summer league. So, uh, all right, let's, uh, I'm going to find a guy right now because my producer can't freaking find him. I'm going to read you the rock. Um, I'm going to read you the rock. Jaden Springer. Jaden Springer, for crying out loud. Jaden Springer's Washington. his name. All right. All right. Um, all right, let me move on to more basketball in the first part of this uh, podcast. The under-16 tournament I was watching. I watched some high school basketball. And I watched it for one reason. Because, you know, I like it to listen to serious uh, NBA radio, especially with my buddy Frank Isola and Brian Scalabrini. Scalabrini, former NBA player, has been talking about uh, a high school kid named Cooper Flagg for the last year. He said, there's this kid under the radar that I, I work with a training named Cooper flag. He's a white kid from Maine. So Scalabrini's in Boston. I guess they, they, they found a place to wear. And so Scalabrini gets hired to work out these kids. Cooper and, and flag, two G's, um, two G's. Cooper flag with two G's. Uh, and, and I've been hearing this hype about him. And all of a sudden he burst upon the scene and I heard other people start talking about him. Now he's in Maine. But he played, and now he's getting exposure with all these these teams. And there was the uh, this high school tournament, which is uh, called the Peach Jam, uh, in Georgia, which is the like the premier uh, tournament for for these uh, AAU teams. And his main team made the finals against Carlos Boozer's kids team, who was the favorite to win it. Carlos Boozer's had twin sons that play on this team, 
Uh, I believe they're out of New York. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, uh, his his one son is supposed to be the number one. Rec- these are juniors now. So it would be the class of 2024. He's supposed to be the number one recruit in the entire class. Cooper Fly all of a sudden moved up to the number two recruited player. Like, I got to see this kid. Well, the kid is is legit. <laughs> I mean, he's he's a rebounder. He's a shooter. He's a ball handler. He's six eight, probably still growing. And then I started to think. Uh, so because I'm watching the Maine team, and they're five white kids from Maine, like tucked away in the cold regions of Maine. All of a sudden, they're this great AAU team, and they're playing Carlos Booger's team, and they lost in the finals. It was a great game, and uh, uh, Carlos Booger's kids team pulled away at the end. But this Cooper Fly is legit. He now goes to Monverde High School in Florida, where Ben uh, Simmons went and D'Angelo Russell and a lot of other guys. So he's getting exposure that way. He'll be uh, going into uh, his junior year there. Uh, and they're saying he should escalate his schooling so he could be college eligible quicker than, than normal. Uh, but I'm starting to think, is the hype for this kid because he's a white kid? I mean, it's always legitimate when you talk about like we overreact that when there's a white kid in basketball, we always overreact to his ability because white people, I think, need a savior in 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 basketball, right? So all of a sudden, there's the next Larry Bird coming along, uh, and his name is Cooper Fly. But anyway, keep that name in mind. His name is Cooper Fly, and I became aware of him because Scalabrini's been talking about him for a year, and I'm going, "Well, Scalabrini's blowing smoke. I think he's a kid in Maine. How good could he be?" But the kid's legit. And his brother, Ace Flag, is also on the team. And I think schools are recruiting Ace Flag just so they get a, get a shot at Cooper Flag. But he, he's like number one, number two on everybody's You and I used to work with a guy time. named he, Rob Cherry, the great the legend Rob Cherry, news director at IP, who used to, who used to talk all the time about uh, this white kid with red hair from Maryland who was uh, nicknamed the Jewish Jordan. <laughs> he, would, he would never shut up yeah. about him. Yeah, I remember that kid. <laughs> Uh, that, that kid wound up going to Kai. I can't remember what his name was, but he wound up. Uh, yeah, he would. He would wear a yarmulke, I think. Yeah, he games. was pretty good. I, I don't uh, I his name. Yeah, I, I don't know whether he ever got. to. I think he may have gotten to the college level. I don't remember who that kid is, yeah. but I do remember him. Uh, all right. So 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 there you go. Uh, go. That's uh, uh, the basketball chat for today. Let's talk about what happened last night it was the home run derby. Now, you know, home run derby is interesting. For a, to a point with me, and then it gets kind of like repetitive and old. But I was watching these guys, and I'm going, people do not realize how difficult uh, and and how it saps your strength when you're swinging 100 miles an hour on every pitch, trying to jack every pitch. Batting practice for those who haven't played a lot of baseball, you take a lot of batting practice. Batting practice really wears you out. In, in the game, it's interesting because. You know, you, uh, but it's the batting practice that really fatigues you because you're te- constantly taking batting practice. And guys that take batting practice usually try to use it productively by hitting the ball the other way. They're not trying to jack balls uh, out on every swing. These guys are taking like 200 jack swings in, in that uh, home run derby last night. So uh, Vladdy Jr. won it. He came back after a couple of years of an absence. Uh, the guy who that he won it with many years ago is the manager currently of uh, the the uh, 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 Blue Jays, Schneider, and he he requested that he come back and pitch to him again, and he pitched him again, and Vladdy wound up winning it, beating Julio Rodriguez, the hometown favorite from the Seattle Mariners. But I watched the first round, and Julio Rodriguez was insane. He hit forty one home runs in the first first round. Uh, and I, like, I, I just want you like, I want you to go out and swing a bat. Like those guys probably 33, 34 ounce bat. Swing a bat 200 times, see how you feel. Uh, where you're trying to jack ball and you're, and you're torquing. And, and this is why a uh, guy, guys, that home run derby messes up people. It may, it may mess you up. It may mess you up because you're fatigued, because you're using muscles that ha- you're wearing down. So I, that's what I look at. I look at how amazing these guys are. To uh to take that many swings at that violent a pace because you're 
you're averaging like 106 miles an hour <laughs> ball ball speed coming off the bat, and you did jump to generate bat speed. Oh to yeah, get and to Vlad that was visibly exhausted after every one of his rounds. Like he was like almost doubled over and panting. Yeah, it's it's exhausting, man. It takes you, your muscles are like when you like if you go to the gym and you bench press or something. After after you bench press, your muscles are just depleted, and that's the kind of feeling it is when you take that kind of BP, violent BP, where you're trying to jack everything out. Uh, but anyway, um, Vladdy Jr. wins it. I, 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 I really get a kick out of the Latino faction that celebrates this because they're all they're all hanging together. They all know each other because they've all made it to this level. So they, they all are supporting each other. Uh, and I love it because I'm trying to I'm trying to learn Spanish again. And I'm trying to like those little conversations. I love I would love to be able to interpret. And, uh, you know, they had Eduardo, uh, Eduardo Perez interpret most of them, but they sent Bo Bichette over there as uh, <laughs> he knows three words in Spanish. What are they, how are they doing? He, oh, I don't know. I, whatever they whatever you said, Eduardo, uh, he's the roving reporter. He can't understand it, uh, three words. That I love saying. when it's all when the dad uh, pitches yeah, to the kid, good. when it, when one of the players has his dad. But Abby Rushman last night. Well, that was Adley, Adley Rushman. Rushman. Adley Rushman. Yeah, Adley Rushman, the the uh, the kid who's the catcher, yeah. phenom catcher for the Baltimore Orioles, was the number one pick in the draft out of Oregon State. Lost like he he lost by one home run. The kid Jack twenty eight. He came back for his extra time and he went <laughs> right handed because he's a switch hitter. But but here's the here's the beauty of this whole story. Now what's trending with Adley Rushman? I don't know if you've seen this on Twitter. There was a blonde that was sitting next to his mother, and I assume that was his girlfriend. It was his sister. And so now everybody, now his sister has gained like a, a zillion likes on and follows on Twitter or whatever, social media, because like, but oh, Natalie Rushman's sister's a smoke show. She was the highlight of the whole thing. They weren't even looking at the mother. The camera stayed on her. The mother sat down. The camera stayed on her. That's great. I uh, I hey, was man. actually I didn't notice I didn't get to see that. I have to go back and look. I was actually working while I was watching the Derby out back last night. There you go. You didn't see her? No, I gotta check her out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And blonde hair girl. He's a blonde hair kid. Like he's he's from the plains of Oregon, right? This kid. Uh, and now he's in, in, in Baltimore. But that kid was impressive, man. That that's pressure. You're a young kid. You got your legs have to be jiggly. In a situation like that, competing against all those home run hitters. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that kid. Yeah, let's move on to the uh, Major League Baseball draft, which happened this week. Um, the Philly, Phillies didn't have a high pick, so uh, they wound up taking a kid named uh, Aiden Miller. This is the classic value pick. Aiden Miller missed uh, almost all of his senior season. He's a power-hitting third baseman. He had a broken handmade bone. This is the same thing that Mike Trout just suffered. It's a little bone in the wrist. It's a hook bone, and the torque of a swing kind of breaks off the hook and so it takes a while to heal like four weeks to eight weeks so uh, that kid missed his almost entire senior season but as a junior was regarded as one of the best power hitting prospects in the draft so they took a high school third baseman named Aiden Miller from Tampa who knows how that's going to work out but it's a value pick the kid was a power hitter he missed his whole senior year that's why he dropped to 27 the Phillies took him on another note Kevin McGonigal the kid from uh, Bonner Prendy went 37th to the Tigers. So that was a, kind of in a supplemental round after the first round. So technically, he's a first-round pick. I, I am stunned that I, I didn't realize the slot. They have sl pay slots now for these uh, for these draft picks. This kid, who, by the way, is signed uh, uh, at Auburn and is, is considering whether to go to college or go to, uh, to, to pros at the, the Tigers, his slot bonus – is two point three million dollars. Now, Darren, I'm going to make you this kid. You go, you go to Auburn. You probably get a little nil money to Auburn. It's a big baseball program. Or do you sign for two point three million dollars? Take the money. You can always go back to school. Take yeah. the money. Yeah, you're not going to well, go back to school. Right. Once you take the money, you're not going back to school. To study what you want. Yeah, but you're not going back. Yeah, but you're not going back. You take the money. The whole thing. You take the money. All right. <laughs> I agree. Two point three million dollars. I'm taking the money. Good luck to that kid, Kevin Mc McMonagall. I don't know if he'll be a shortstop at the next level, uh, but that ends uh, our top uh, that we call the current on the Mike Missinelli podcast. It's the Mike Missinelli podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. 
Well, our next guest on the Mike Missnelli podcast, it, it, it does not get any bigger. Listen, we've had some big guests here. We, we had Barkley, we had Stephen A. recently, we had, uh, we had all kinds of national guests. It's no bigger than this guy. Ian Eagle, one of the heavyweights of sports broadcasting, NBA, NFL, college hoops, and that's on, yes, tennis channel, track and field. And he had just been named the National Sportscaster of the Year. And, and believe me, that was a pretty stiff competition. Ian Eagle joins us. Ian, how are you doing today? Hey, Mike. Great to talk to you, bud. Great to talk to you. And so much to talk about. But first of all, uh, what, what does that do for your ego? National Sportscaster <laughs> uh, of the Year. I get, get that out of the way right away because that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, Mike, I, I really wanted a, a longer intro. I, I didn't feel like <laughs> there were enough accolades. No, that was amazing. We had a really nice weekend in North Carolina, bunch of friends, bunch of colleagues, bunch of young aspiring broadcasters. It, it was pretty special. And, you know, you, you get hardened in this business because of the, the nature of it. And every now and again, you are reminded that people listen, people give a shit, people care. And it it was an honor, truly an honor. I know sometimes we say that, but it, it was a really nice couple of days. I love to give a shit because we are a podcast and that works <laughs> very well for the people in Philly that are, that are listening. Uh, listen, you're, uh, here, here's the thing about you. And broadcasters have a funny relationship with their listenership and some yeah. can be excellent and people will dislike them for whatever reason. I haven't heard one person that says they don't like you. <laughs> so what, what really, what, what is the secret? How, how do you satisfy the masses? Oh, uh, drugs, heavy, heavy <laughs> drugs, Mike. I have no idea what people are saying because I'm heavily sedated. Uh, no, I think authenticity matters a lot in this business. And especially if you're going to be in it for a long period of time, people can sniff out BS. And if you're playing a part, if it's contrived, eventually, I think people figure that out. If it's coming from a real place, if you really want to be there at the games, the hope is that translates on the air. I really want to be there. I really like doing this job. I have enjoyed every aspect of it. I've enjoyed the evolution of it. I've enjoyed developing a style and working with my partners. I think that's the other part of it too. Like somewhere along the line, Mike, I figured out the best approach to this job is try to make your analyst look good, make them comfortable, make them feel like they're in a position to succeed. And then everybody succeeds. It's still a team concept. And if you're only looking at it through the lens of an individual, then odds are the listeners or the viewers can feel that. So if you're in it together and if your partner realizes that there's a trust factor that I'm not going to take them somewhere, I'm not willing to go myself, I'm going to have their back and I'm actually going to listen to what they have to say, try to tag it, uh, incorporate what they say later in a, a telecast, actually pay attention and care and be interested in what they're saying. That, that seems to actually pay some dividends in this business. Uh, yeah, and it's a skill because you worked with a lot of partners. So uh, yeah. a little later, I want to get back to how how you were able how you were able to blend uh, those uh, so many partners. But let's go back to the beginning. And one of the reasons I, I love the story is because conception you started the, from the ground. My, well, my parents. <laughs> yes, with conception. Let's start with conception. Conception. So, a, a little, <laughs> a little, eye, a little eye and eagle uh, <laughs> after conception. Uh, how soon were or how old were you when you first decided, you know what, I, I, I want to be a, a sports announcer, play by knew, play guy? Yeah, I knew it at eight years old. And it it's funny to think back on it now, but I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. I went to my parents individually and told them that's what I was interested in. And both said to me, well, that's what you'll do. And that's empowering. When your parents tell you at a young age that you can do something, this was 1977. Uh, this was not necessarily a, a common option for a kid at that point. But I was fascinated by Marv Albert and the voice of the Mets, Bob Murphy, 
Uh, eventually, guys like Al Michaels and Bob Costas and Vern Lundquist, uh, those were the, the broadcasters that, that really had an effect on me and resonated with me in some way. And local guys in the New York area. I grew up in Queens. And Mike, the other part, my parents were in entertainment. My dad was a stand-up comedian. He was an actor. He was a musician. My mom was a singer. She was an actress. So looking outside the box was not a big deal. Yes, that, that alone is fascinating, your background with your parents. And uh, so like the, the entertainment part of them, did that influence you to go that way? Yeah, big time. Big time. I Okay. I would Did go, you want to be a singer? No, no. I, so I would go on the <laughs> yeah. road with them every weekend of my life for the first five, six years. That's all I knew. They played the Catskills. So it was the Concord Hotel, uh, Grossinger's, Neville, Homawack, Browns, uh, you name it. Uh, I was there and I saw their act hundreds upon hundreds of times. My mother was the opener. My father came out after, and then they would come out and do some shtick together. And there was a stretch about a year when I was six years old, they would bring me out. They'd put me in a, in a suit and it was green corduroy. I had two suits, a green corduroy suit and this brown suit that worked in the seventies, mid seventies. And it's probably back in style now. And I would go out there, I would do impressions. I did... Uh, Howard Cosell, Muhammad Ali, W.C. Fields. These were these were big, big time <laughs> impressions. <of the> day. <laughs> and I would do about five minutes, Mike. And there was a rush, sometimes in front of 1,200 people, sometimes in front of 500 people. And there was this direct response that clearly I was into, although I retired after a year. I, I had enough of it. I felt there were some child, child labor laws that were being violated, and I got out. I got out on top. But yeah, it planted a seed. There's no doubt in my mind it planted a seed. Uh, are you tempted to break out one of your impressions during a broadcast? <laughs> I mean, it was it was a pretty basic act. It was Howard Cosell interviewing Muhammad Ali. Muhammad, Muhammad, uh, Howard Cosell. I was basically doing a Billy Crystal. Yeah. I, I was talking about basically all you can eat gefilte fish or stuffed derma. You know, these, these were, these were killer jokes back in the day. My uh, that, that is awesome. You brought Bob, Bob Murphy. I'll tell you a quick little story because my dad was a TV repairman and a guy who would put the old antennas on a home oh, wow. before like all this. You know. So we were able, we had a rotor of an antenna. We used to get New York channels. We got WOR. So sure. I used to watch the Mets all the time. Oh, Bob crazy. Murphy. I don't know if you go, do you go back as far as Lindsey Nelson? I do. Yeah, it was Lindsey Nelson, Murph, and Ralph Kiner. That was the triumph. Exactly. Kiner's corner. And, and, and Lindsey Nelson, I still remember him saying, and it's a home run by Wayne Garrett. <laughs> you know, he, had squeak, he had that squeaky voice. I still remember it. It's like in, in my brain, I must have been eight years old. Oh, that's uh, hilarious. Okay. Yeah. So those. Those Mets teams were bad when I was growing up. You know, keep in mind the Yankees are winning championships. I'm showing up at school with a Lee Mazzilli lunchbox and just getting crushed. And it it made you appreciate it when they actually got good. 1986, it was my freshman year of college. They win the World Series. I'm basically ossified at that moment. It, at Syracuse, Boston fans are there. And I'm God, God knows what I put in my system that night. They win it in seven games and it just felt like complete euphoria as a fan because of the lean years with Nino Espinosa, Steve Henderson, Pat Zachary, Craig Swan, Willie Montanez, on and on and on and on. Uh, and so let's start with Syracuse then, because obviously a product of New Health School of Journalism, where so many great journalists and broadcasters have been spawned. Uh, and you're there at a time where Syracuse basketball is golden. I mean, we're, we're talking about yeah. the DC, Billy Owens, Sherman Douglas, all those guys. And so were you broadcasting there then? Yeah, I was. So there was a cast system in place at Syracuse. You could imagine the amount of students that wanted to do it. It appealed to a certain aptitude and interest level of broadcasting students. So 
it was survival of the fittest in many ways. And it did give you a sense of what the business might be like after graduation because of the competition of it. So I started doing women's basketball to start and then eventually got the men's games, football games, lacrosse. It was all part of the process there. So junior year, I was doing basketball games on the college radio station, more of them senior year, but all the names you just mentioned, Cyc Lee, Sherman Douglas, uh, eventually Dave Johnson, another professional, Billy yeah, Owen, Stevie Michael Thompson. Edwards. Yep, Stevie Thompson, yep, Michael yep. Edwards from Voorhees, New Jersey. Yes. It, it was a stacked, stacked group. Yeah, uh, always nationally ranked top 10. Uh, so now out of college, you start, uh, interestingly enough, WFAN had started, I guess, in the late 80s. I, I was a newspaper journalist and went to WIP, which followed WFAN and as the Philly version of it. But you start out like my producer, Darren, was a producer back in Ray. You start out as yep. a producer at w, WFAN. What shifts were, were you and, and where did you want to take that? So I was an intern in between my junior and senior year, which was very eye-opening, pre-internet, where you had to try to visualize what this all was about. And I get into that environment and I go back for my senior year of college and I feel like I just have an advantage over everybody because I've seen stuff. Uh, I've seen how the sausage is made. And I went back with a real confidence and conviction in how to do this. So I get contacted February of my senior year. There's a job opening. It's going to be a nighttime producer. They're going to shift some roles around. Would you be interested in interviewing for the position? And I wanted to be on the air. I made no bones about that. Eventually, I had job offers in West Virginia and in Buffalo to be on the air. And I take this opportunity and I interview for the job. And I'm told, basically, look, you're not going to get the job. There are people more qualified than you, but come in. It'll be good experience. I meet with the program director, Mark Mason, at the time. And we just hit it off in the first two minutes. He's laughing at my jokes. He's interested in me. He's interested in my background. And we talk for 25 minutes. And at the end of the conversation, he says, well, when could you start? I said, well, I graduate May 10th. I could start May 13th. And he stood up. He shook my hand. He said, all right, we'll let you know. You know something to that effect. And I walked out of there. I went back to my dad's house in Forest Hills. And I'm going to drive back to Syracuse. And Eric Spitz, who's now a big wig at Sirius, he was leaving the position, the 7 to Midnight producing job, to take on more of a management role, assignment editor. He calls me at my father's house. I'm literally in the driveway about to leave. My dad comes out, says, uh, hey, there's a call for you. And it's Eric. He says, what the hell did you say to Mark Mason? I said, I don't know. He just had a nice chat. He said he wants to hire you and he wants to keep the job open until you're ready to take it. I said, I, I guess that that's a good thing. No, he goes, I, yeah. Damn right. It's a good thing. So I take the job and this was March. They kept it for me until May, literally May 13th. I started and I was told in no uncertain terms, if you want to be on the air, do not take this job. You're not going to get on the air this way. And I took it anyway, just to be in that place and to learn and via osmosis observe and it turned out to be the best decision I ever made because about 15 months later, as cliche as it sounds, somebody got sick. Pat Harris was doing updates, had pneumonia. I got called in last minute to do updates on a football Sunday, September of 1991. I did well enough to get called back the next week, then the next week, the next week, the next week. And by 1992, I co-hosted a show with Steve Levy, Super Bowl show, five hours leading up to the Bills and the then Washington Redskins. And then that was it. I got the Jody McDonald leaves FAN. I get his weekend overnight shift. And uh, I also got his regular guest. <laughs> yeah. Howie Schwab, Howie Schwab and Ruckle wow. Baxter, they came with the territory. <laughs> and yeah. it was a whole lot of that. People calling in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and, you know, they wanted to. They were doing their own Jody Max to me. It was 
So it was great. And it was an education for me, true education. <laughs> yes. Well, and, and they, so, yeah, I, I met Mark Mason because we, we were kind of in the same umbrella, CBS Radio, then went to Infinity. Uh, uh, and then, uh, I know, the John Fulham, was he involved back then? You remember a guy named John Fulham? No? No, I think he predated okay. me. Okay. Uh, and he came to Philly. Uh, so within a short period of time, you're doing Jets pre and post and then CBS. So you, yeah. you must have really made an impression. So, so what? 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 We, did you define your style at that point? Did you know exactly what kind of a broadcaster you wanted to be, and how to deliver it, and and knew what people really wanted to hear? I had a sense of how I wanted to be on the air. I wanted to be conversational. I, I was trying to avoid being robotic, but I also wanted to be good in a variety of roles. Uh, I prided myself on being versatile. So if it was updates, I attacked it. If it was hosting, I viewed it as an extension of what I would do as a play-by-play -play guy, being able to take you from point A to point B to point C. Felt like I could bring levity. So with callers, I always thought I could shine. And then when play-by-play -play became my real position, I viewed that as a chance that we had a blank canvas. I started on radio with the Nets and the Jets and then transitioned to television. I got TV opportunities one year after each of those roles. So only a year on radio with the Nets, got the TV job the next year, year on radio with the Jets, got the CBS job the year after that. A big break for me, Mike, was 1993. So Mark Mason leaves the radio station, heads over to 1010 Wins. Mark Chernoff replaces him. And Mike, I know you've been through this in your career. You get a change in management and you have no idea at that point if the new person likes you, digs your style, wants to get rid of you. You know nothing. And it's a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. So Mark Chernoff takes over. I'd never met Mark. Eric Spitz is still at WFAN at this point. Eric tells me, hey, look, I'm having a meeting with Mark Chernoff. We're going to go over everybody at the radio station, and I'll let you know what he thinks, and we'll go from there. And I just remember that 24-hour period, which was late 92 into 93, I feel like my life could go one way or the other. Either this guy likes me or doesn't, and then I'm going to have to make some decisions. I get the call from Eric Spitz. He goes, yeah, talk to Mark. He really likes you. So you're good. Like that. That simple. Nah. So they get the Jets rights in 93. Mark Chernoff makes me the pre and post game host of the Jets. And that's really for me when things began to take off. I had my own thing and it was a lot of responsibility. Them getting the Jets was a huge, huge deal at the time, breaking into rights other than Mets baseball. And I took it and I ran with it. And I ended up uh, becoming the voice of the Jets a few years later got the Nets job uh, back in 94, and then things started to, to really click after that. Well, they, they certainly click. Let, let's, uh, let, when you're doing a game, I, I know this is really tough because some broadcasters can be over the top of their enthusiasm and you really feel it. It feels phony. But you, your excitement level, I think, is, is, is perfect. Uh, nice. So how, how, do you, how do you negotiate that part of it? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's trial and error. And that's based on doing literally thousands and thousands and thousands of games. I get the Nets job in 1994 at 25. So that's 82 games right out of the gate of repetition. And I'm doing it on a radio station, which was a, a, basically an oldie station. It was 1560 AM. At some point, it turned to Disney. So that's what was happening for that particular station at the time. Jonathan Schwartz, if you remember that name, he was the, the big DJ and the big personality at the station. But I was doing it in relative anonymity. And in a way, it helped. The Nets were an afterthought. I got 82 games to hone my style, to work on things, to make mistakes, to improve, to pivot, to adjust. I get the TV job the next year. I have no bad habits based on the fact that I only did radio for one year. So it's not as if I had this very particular style. I was still figuring it out. Then on top of it, I get Bill Raftery as my broadcast partner on the TV side. 
We do 50 games together at that point. The next year we do another 50. I'm doing 82. I'm doing all of them. Bill's busy. He's doing 50. He's doing college basketball. He's flying east to west. He's taking red eyes. It was insane. I was I was blown away. Ironically, it's it's a schedule that I then took on in my own life years later. But at the time, I was flabbergasted that this man could do it and still be energetic and fresh and excitable and into it and engaged with every ooh, like every game he brought that same onions. I was the first guy sitting yeah. next to him when he used the term onions. It was a Nets Miami Heat game. Kevin Edwards, former DePaul star, hit a corner jumper late in the game. And after the jumper, it put the Nets up by one. We're going to break. And Bill Raftery going to break says, Ooh, onions. And we go to commercial. <laughs> and I, at that point, thought that I was the preeminent Raft to English translator in the 48 contiguous states. And I didn't know what he was talking about. We go to break. I go, Raf, onions, what, like so good it made you cry? He goes, no, bird, big balls. <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, I got I got that right away from here because I, I, I knew him. But, so let's talk about your partners because I want you to dish on all of them. So, so Raftery, uh, Raftery is a guy, and I've talked to Jay Wright many times about this. He said, you know, I love when he comes in. But it's it's like uh, uh, you have to have stamina oh. because the guy is like after the game, what's it go here? What's it go there? A big steak. And you, you look up, it's one o'clock in the morning and he's still going strong. Have you been lured into that with rap? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got sucked in my first three years. So from 94 to 97, I didn't know you could leave. I had no idea. It's two in the morning. It's 2.15. I'm still sitting there. And he said, hey, how about one more? No more, no more. <laughs> and I finally realized after the third year that I could go and I would start leaving at 12, 12, 15, like a normal person, 1230. And it would be funny. The, the whole reaction at first rapid, Hey, don't ruin a good party bird. You, uh, and then yeah. I would, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. And then the next day I'd be concerned yeah. that, Oh, Bill's going to be pissed. And I'd go into the, the hotel gym, and he'd be on the treadmill. Still amazing to me. And he'd be doing his dopey walk in the treadmill, and I'd walk over sheepishly. Hey, Raph, how you doing? Oh, hey, bird. We had fun, huh? <laughs> Either he had no recollection or he just bounced back and didn't care. All right, quickly, give me, give me a synopsis on, on the guys that you've worked with. Just a quick, impressionable, the, the impressionable stuff with, with your partners. Well, I mean, Charles, Dave, Charles Davis, give me Charles Davis. Oh, he's, like, what, he's, he's, he's so, like, he's complete. so knowledgeable. He's an encyclopedia. Uh, the other part about it, Mike. Talks a lot. Talks a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I talks a lot. <laughs> I, I don't I've, see I've it that way. Him, I've left him on radio for that. Oh, oh my God, no, I don't see it that way. Hey. Come on, Ian. Come on, Ian. Go to beans. It's a yak yet on, right, Ian? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it that way. The guy knows so much about so many things. I could throw anything his way and he can take it and go with it. I realized this, our, our first year together was the COVID year. So we're not allowed to travel in the same car together. We can't have a lunch together. We have to travel separately to the game. And then there's a glass partition between us and we have to stand six feet apart. That was our whole first year together. And I want to say our first game, we're doing Baltimore against Cleveland and J.K. Dobbins comes up after a carry. And he now says, you know, I talked to his high school coach. I'm like, what? When? What? What? He blew me away. He went next level on things that I did not anticipate. You know, I worked with Dan Fouts for 10 years on CBS we had a blast. We had a similar sense of humor. We got one another. It was just very easy. When the broadcast is easy, it's because you share a similar view of what this is all about. And I, I would like to say, Mike, I can't say it definitively. I've, I've worked with about 145 different partners over the course of my career. I'd like to say I found chemistry, at least a morsel of it with all of them. But of course, some you connect more with and you find some commonality and others, you got to work at it a little bit more. 
but I'm I'm cool with that. I like that part of the job. I like the Rubik's cube of that. Uh, yeah, obviously it's the Philly centric podcast. So uh, your experience with, with with broadcasting games in Philly. What do you think of Philly as a sports town? Because uh, a lot of people look at it and go, eh. yeah. the, the initial impression of Philly is Philly bad. No, <laughs> no. But what, 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 how, how do you come out with it? Well, I, just, I love the passion. And I, I actually enjoy at the venue where the tone of the night takes you. And it's based, obviously, on the results with the home team. But I'll go in there as a Nets announcer. And it'll be a completely different experience than going in there as a TNT announcer or doing a game on Westwood being cramped in a small booth or doing a game on CBS where you have uh, the run of the place because you've got one of the biggest broadcast booths in the NFL when you're there for the, the network broadcast. I've always enjoyed it. Look, I live an hour and 35 minutes from either venue. So there's a convenience factor that I love. I know I'm going to get home. I know I can get there easy. Uh, I get a different level of parking pass based on my assignment, and that could affect things. (laughs) If I'm doing a TV game, you might get some help getting out of there. If you do the radio game, you're with the masses and you're looking at uh, an hour trying to get out of uh, Lincoln Financial Field. so quickly, what are the Sixers right now? Because people are freaking out yeah. at this point with the Harden situation. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I got to see James Harden up close and personal with the Nets. Uh, he actually, when he got to Brooklyn from Houston, was playing at an MVP-like level, then dealt with some injuries, hamstring stuff. He was never quite the same. He wasn't himself in that postseason run where they lost to the Bucks in seven games. I think he became disinterested after that. He realized it wasn't his vibe, and he did everything in his power to get out of there, which he did. Gets to Philly again. Honeymoon was nice. I think there's still some quality basketball in him, but he's not the guy that he once was, and that is hard for certain guys to deal with. The- well, I don't think he knows that, though, Ian. He may not. I don't think he, I don't think he knows that. Mike, he may not. The whole- and I, yeah. look, yeah. You know, let's take Carmelo Anthony as an example. Carmelo was a gifted scorer, uh, was a guy that was prolific in his role for many, many years. It was hard for him to accept that he was no longer the Carmelo Anthony of old. And he did, to a point, James, I think, does see himself still as an alpha and that's where it's going to get tricky with Philadelphia and his role and whether or not he wants to be a part of this thing. Uh, I happen to think Nick Nurse is a tremendous coach. I think he's a great tactician. Whatever happened at the end of Toronto, whether he got disillusioned with the roster, whether management didn't think he was developing talent, it's really irrelevant now. I think it was a good pick. And I think he can maximize some of the pieces that he has in Philadelphia. If I'm James Harden, if I'm him, I come back for another year, Play the year. and try it. I think that actually might happen. I know we uh, we have to close out with you because you're on a time schedule. Two quick things. First of all, congratulations with your son Noah following uh, in your footsteps, like the, like like Kenny Albert. I mean, it's got to be an amazing uh, feeling for you, right? No, it's beyond beyond. I, even <laughs> if he was just interested in what I did, I think as a parent that that tickles you to some degree. That oh, he's asking questions or he's curious. When he decides he actually wants to do it, that's a, another level. And then beyond it, when he's actually good at it. Because it's funny, when my wife and I, Elisa, dropped him off at Syracuse, we pull out of his dorm driveway, we make a left turn onto 81 to get back into New Jersey. You have to go through Pennsylvania. And about five minutes into the ride, my wife turns to me, and she went to Syracuse as well, and she asked me, she said, what if he's not good at this? <laughs> like a legitimate question because he's, we've dropped him off. He's going into broadcasting. He's following this path. And I said, I think he's going to be good. I, I don't think you should worry. I think he's going to be okay. But there is that That's moment. Awesome. You have no idea until, yeah. you know, until you put the, the headset yeah, well, on and the mic. Like, 
you don't know. It's like Agassi, Agassi and Steffi Griff's child. Yeah. Like, like how, <laughs> how good is that? <laughs> exactly. Is, she, is he or she going to be a great tennis player? All right, last thing. You're, you're taking over the, the uh, Jim Nance role, which is just amazing to succeed Jim Nance at yeah. uh, NCAA basketball in the tournament and the whole thing. Are, are we then now going to have an uh, uh, Iron Eagle clothing line? <laughs> Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. listen, listen, listen. I mean, I'm in Nordstrom one day. I didn't even know. I go Jim Nance inspired clothing. I'm going. Wow. What? Yeah. Uh, but you have the. You could have a cool a eagle logo. Athletic, I'm, like, like, I'm a 44 athletic. Yeah. Oh, here, Darren. Here's the only problem. We we do have a line. It's only youth large. That's it. <laughs> that's it. So anything that uh, I can wear. That's all we're producing. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, I, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks Great so much for coming you on. My- Best of success. And, uh, you know, you're, you're at the top of your profession and stay there for many, many years. Dude, I, really I, I really appreciate it. Coming on. Great to finally talk thanks. to you, Darren. Thanks. We'll do it again down the road. Sounds good. Right. Thanks, Ian. I am Eagle, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Mike Nussanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. All righty. Thanks so much to Ian Eagle for spending some time with us. That was great. I love talking to him. He is a absolute regular dude. Uh, you know, you, you, you interview some people that have a little bit of an air. I mean, he's a superstar now in the broadcasting world, right? But he he just comes off like like a regular guy. So it was great to touch base with uh, Ian Eagle. And uh, thanks, uh, Ian, for coming on. Uh, Bird, as uh, we, I didn't call him Bird. I, you know, I, I couldn't. I, I don't like to do that because I don't know him intimately enough to call him Bird. But it's a great nickname, isn't it's it? Great. Iron it really Eagle is. Bird. Birdman, it's fantastic. It's, it, yeah, it's one of the great nicknames. Uh, all right. So let's go with now Mike Unleashed. And, and we'll start with Mike Unleashed. You never know where I'm going to go here. We'll start with a, a serious topic and the situation with the, the scandal in Northwestern football that cost head coach Pat Fitzgerald his job. Um, this has so many layers to it. First of all, um, originally Fitzgerald over the scandal got a two-week suspension now without pay. But the, the outrage was so much and more stuff came out uh, about this program that went into racial lines that, that finally the president had no choice but to zip them. So a, a, a university football hero who coached there for 17 years is now out on his ass. And uh, and I got to be honest with you, editorially, justifiably so, because when you read what happened in this situation and by the way, this scandal was broken by student journalists at Northwestern, which is considered one of the top journalist schools in America. So uh, the kids that come out of there really know what they're doing. Uh, I guess the most famous journalistic uh, uh, grads of the Northwestern school, uh, Mike Greenberg and uh, I think uh, Michael Wilbon, uh, but it's produced many journalists. And you know, if you aspire to be a journalist, you, Syracuse is a place to go, Northwestern is a place to go, Columbia is a place to go, three uh, three schools that uh, I would would have, would have wanted to go to when my parents said, I don't have the money for that particular situation. <laughs> so uh, I wound up going to Penn State, which was uh, which was valuable for me uh, anyway. Uh, so in, I here's the thing that I, I uh, it really bugs me about this whole thing. Um, this this notion of hazing. I, I, like can, can we get past this hazing nonsense now it's it's 2023 are we still juvenile to the point where we need to do hazing and this hazing took on another level let's just go into it uh coerce sexual acts like what what, what why what's the point of that whole thing uh running and it's got this thing called they did called running where you, you walk through this gauntlet of pain and and, and got, uh, guys on the team dry hump you and, 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 and what like what I don't understand. Freshmen, if they make a mistake, they go in the locker room. They they, they uh, are uh, there's they touch other men, uh, like rub up against other men with their naked bodies, and then somebody gets a hose and shoots them in the private areas. Like I, I don't understand. Like what is that supposed to do except embarrass people? That doesn't bond you. And people say, well, Mike, they do it in the military. Yeah, well, it, it, the code reds have tried to be eliminated by the mil- military. Yeah, so. But but again, that's a completely different thing. Like the training for that and the bonding of that is a little different than a sport. Like you're defending a nation, right? So I so I don't know what whether generals will tell you that that's invaluable or not. But it, it it just seems juvenile when you have to do it in football, and, it, and it's got to be taken out. It's it to me, it's ridiculous. So in, in any event, uh, they also had a, a, a thing called naked quarterback exchange, where. 
the freshman with naked would snap the ball to a naked guy who's got his hands under the guy's private area, like stuff like this. I go, what the fuck are you people doing down there? Right. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So anyway, this guy uh, Fitzgerald claimed he didn't know about it. Right. So it, it, there's no way that uh, he didn't know about it. And, and in a lot of cases, the players said, yeah, he was he sanctioned it. He thought it was team bonding. And, and so he had to go. But once the racial implications came out where coaches had racial remarks and, and they were using uh, uh, slurs against uh, players and, and stereotyping the Hispanic players and the whole thing. Once that happens, the guy's got to go. He, he, he can't, couldn't take it out now. Let me just because a lot of people say, "Well, what about you, Mike?" All right, now we'll bring the, I will bring this up because years ago on my show, I was duped by a fake caller named Dwayne from Swedesboro. Now, the people who who now, if you know me and you think that I would stand for something like that if I knew about it, well, I think you better check yourself because. I did not know about that. I was duped just like everybody else. And the two people who were responsible for that were suspended and um, for doing it. And I had no idea that that happened. And had I known it at the time, I would have shut it down immediately. So for the people that want to label that, I was appalled by that whole thing once, once I found out what it was. People said, well, you should have known about it. Well, I, I show up and do a show in a radio booth. It is, I am not. On a, on a football team, I, I am not uh, uh, in charge of an entire football team where I'm supposed to know everything that goes on. I, uh, I I show up and I do a show and I go to the next caller and and I was duped about it. And I, I'll tell you flat out, if you don't believe me, that's fine. But I was appalled when that happened. When they did the investigation, the two people that did it were suspended. So, all right, uh, that's all I have to say about that. All right, let's move on now and let's go to... Uh, uh, the death of the New York Times sports section. Wow. Uh, this is a sign of the times here. So it's because it's internet killed the newspaper star, basically. Uh, once newspapers went to the internet, there was really no need for print anymore. Uh, and when the New York Times purchased the athletic, uh, and I'm not, I'm not justifying what they did because I hate it when journalists lose jobs and they're not going to lose jobs. Actually, you're going to be reassigned to do other things. And I, but again, if you're a sports writer, you get assigned to news. That's, not, you know, it's just unnatural uh, that, that you're used to doing one thing in journalism for, and you want to do that the rest of your life. And now you got to, you got to alter it. Well, once they bought the athletic for $500 million, why not take advantage of the resources? Uh, and so I look at that and I go, Okay, I get why they would do it. They're hemorrhaging money. The Athletic is losing money. The New York Times is responsible for all that. So they're trying to streamline it. It's almost like the Daily News and the Inquirer. You don't have two staffs anymore. You have a blended staff. Uh, and that's the way in this uh, the side of the Times. But people uh, don't buy the paper anymore. And, and, and why would you? You know, like people that buy the paper are just old school people that don't understand the internet and don't know how to access it and are used to, to getting a newspaper. I mean, I still did that for a long time. I got the physical newspaper, but once uh, it went to internet where I could actually get the form of the paper on my screen and scroll down in the same form, like I'm reading a newspaper, there was no need for me to get the physical paper. So that's the sign of the times uh, in the uh, journalistic world, the newspaper world. Uh, but the LA Times also jumped in here. And the L.A. Times is scaling down. They're not going to do game stories anymore. Uh, they're not going to run box scores anymore. They're, they're just going to use features. Uh, and so when you read a newspaper, it's going to be like a magazine. Yeah, no agate page. And then if you want. No agate page. I'm sorry? Right? Take a, yeah. Right. When people don't know what the agate page Ag is. It's like so. box <laughs> like, scores and It's a box score. Yeah, it's a box score page. So, so people are, are not going to. Uh, uh, be able to do that in newspaper more you can still do it in digital form you can look at it and then the game story to be in digital form so it's not like people aren't going to cover the team anymore but it's just a sign of the times in the newspaper industry and a lot of people ask me hey did you guys make the move from newspapers to radio because you saw that trend happening and i can assure you we did not we did not see that trend happening we in, in 1990 newspapers were still viable we just took a chance on another entity. I, I wish we were clairvoyant enough to see that that was going to happen. We were ahead of the curve, but we were not. And, and the newspaper industry was just destroyed uh, by the Internet. For a long time, they couldn't figure out how to make revenue out of the Internet. And now, now they have. So 
Uh, I would I would think that newspapers in general will be extinct within the next five to ten years. There won't be a physical plan. Do you still buy it at all? Any paper? No, I do. I do not buy a paper anymore. And if I'm not buying it, I'm an old school guy who was raised on newspapers. Who who yeah. the reason I'm in this business is because I absorbed newspapers at a young when I was a young kid. At a young age, we got newspapers delivered right to the door, and I. I uh, I was a voracious reader of the newspaper from top to bottom, and that's why uh, I went into journalism. But uh, things, I, I'll still buy them on the weekends in the summer, particularly because I enjoy sitting on the deck down the shore with a cup of coffee, flipping through the pages. Yeah, well, I you can do that computer wise now. I know, but I like having to pick. For, I only do it on the weekends down the shore, and uh, you know whether it's the Yankee or the Daily. Yeah, News see, I've been spoiled because I used to times. do that, but now on the internet you can uh, widen the page, and it's you're re- looking at the newspaper the way it's laid out. So to me, it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, it's a sad commentary, and uh, uh, I hope people, more people, don't lose their jobs. Enough people have lost their jobs in this industry, including uh, at uh, a station that I used to work at, ninety seven five made some further cuts on uh, that and they took out a guy who was on the show that replaced me so sorry sorry to hear that if it indeed was uh, a budget cut but who knows what goes on uh, over there anymore uh i know the ratings uh, i know the ratings haven't been good so it was probably a, a convenient move for them to do that uh, all right so we'll close uh, mike unleashed uh with a comment from debo samuels now, Debo Simmons happens to be one of my favorite uh, players, but the whining that has gone on with the San Francisco 49ers after they, <laughs> they lost to the Eagles is mind-boggling. And it's in their crawl, Dickie. right? And it's in their crawl because they lost their quarterback. Well, those are the breaks. They've now rectified that where you can have another quarterback. They're talking about the, uh, the turf or whatever it is. Uh, so Zach Gelb, who uh, actually was one of my uh, interns, back at 97.5 The Fanatic before he got to CBS Radio. He's doing a good job. And I was on his show uh, several weeks ago. I had Debo Samuel uh, on the line. And uh, Zach brought up the Eagles, and Debo had a reaction to it. Here it is. Debo Samuel here with us. Well, something that is your call. I saw what you said about the Eagles back at the Super Bowl at Sirius, where if Brock Purdy didn't get hurt, you guys would have won that game by double digits. Why, Why would that have been the case? I don't know that though. So do you not still believe that? I mean, I do, but I mean, we we not that shit is like we not gonna keep talking about it. I mean, I said what I said. Gotcha. So then, what happens this year when you play Philly on December third? I don't know. Just wait till what week thirteen, twelve, whatever week it is, and we'll show you. Well, then you know how that's gonna go uh, down. You're you're going into Philadelphia. I, Those fans are gonna be booing you loud. You have a message for Eagles fans? Hey guys. Yeah. All right, we're good to go. What do you mean? We we have Debo on right now. Yeah, I know, but we're gonna head into camp right now. Are, are you serious? Okay, thank you. That's there you Thanks, go. Bye. Debo Samuel, right there, doesn't want to answer a few questions. Uh, are you serious? Yep, he hung up. Okay. He hung up on him. Bang! It's still in their crawl. Now, hey, listen, they'll get their chance of revenge. Let's see you step up to the plate this year, Debo. Because you're playing the, the the Philadelphia Eagles, and we'll see how that works. So all this stuff you do in the off season, uh, you know, doesn't mean squat until you get on the football field. All right, that'll do it for Mike Unleashed today. Uh, that'll do it for the podcast for today. Again, thanks to Ian Eagle. We enjoyed speaking with him. This podcast is brought to you by Bet Rivers, and don't forget my friends at Natural Lawn. It's summertime, a lot of stress can go on your lawn. That's why you need natural lawn to keep it up. A lot of people think they can do the lawn themselves. They go outside a, a couple of days of 90-degree weather, and, and they got scorched earth. So that's why you got to get natural lawn to handle your lawn so your lawn stays green with natural ingredients all year long. Check it out at naturallawn.com. Uh, all right, uh, don't forget my Friday blog. That's going to happen at the end of the week on my website, mikemiss.com where I will opine on certain things that uh, are in my brain. Uh, you can uh, go to MikeMiss.com and email me for the big contest that we have going on on the, the Mike Miss uh, blog, where you can win some uh, Mike Miss podcast swag, including a, a, a beautiful hat that Darren has on. He's got the black hat on today with the great Mike Miss black podcast strong. logo. Yeah. Uh, and we're modeling this like uh, uh, off of uh, what I used to do on the radio show called Sound Off. You, you, you send me a Sound Off email, and it's just as, uh, uh, as good as you call in the – the voice line and leaving a message and 
the best ones and we'll give away a hat every two weeks for the best ones that I receive. Again, you email me, mike at mikemiss.com and, and also follow me on Twitter, uh, mikemiss25. Uh, we have an announcement on uh, the video that's coming your way. In the next couple of weeks, we will be going video with this podcast. So stay tuned for that. I know a lot of people have enjoyed the audio. Uh, video gives you a different perspective because you'll actually get to see the guest on video uh, and we're all set up for it. I've got all this equipment here. It's just a matter of rigging it up, going through a test and, uh, and going to video. And we'll tell you exactly when we will go on video. And also don't forget Cameo. I had to do a Cameo today. These are fun. Cameo.com. Go to Cameo.com. Put my name in. I will give you a personal shout out. And it doesn't, all you have to do is direct me on what you need. Like a lot of ladies uh, give me a cameo request for their uh, husband to be or their husband to birthday, whatever. Uh, the guys, people that were big fans of the show. And I give a personal shout out uh, and I, you get your money's worth, believe me, because I, I delve into your personality. I, I, I hit you where you live. I'll make you feel good on a personal shout out. So just go to cameo.com. And uh, put in my name and, and you'll uh, be able to put in a request for me for a personal shout out. Okay. I think that's about it for today. Anything else, Darren? Did we miss anything? Uh, Thursday, general manager of your Philadelphia Flyers, Danny Briere, will be with us. And next Tuesday, Mike, next Tuesday, July 18th, Joe Davis, top guy of Fox. He spent like six months in and around the Philadelphia area calling the NLCS, the World Series, the Super Bowl. Nobody knows Philly teams better on a national scale. Joe Davis. He's really good. He's one of my favorites. So uh, be glad to talk to Joe and Danny Briere uh, Thursday. Go good to touch back. All you Flyer fans say, oh, you're a Flyer hater, Mike. We're going to have the GM on the podcast, all right? So if you have a question for the GM, Send that in an email as well, Mike at MikeMiss.com. I'll, I'll bring it up to him. I'll de- dedicate a little sp- a special section of this interview with Danny Briere to your questions for the Flyer General Manager and where this organization is going. All right, everybody, have a great rest of the day. The weather looks like it's broken a little bit. We got some sunshine out there. So have a great day, a great rest of the week. We will talk to you on Thursday for the next Mike Miss NLA podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Bissinelli podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.